Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a very special piece of extreme overclocking equipment. This right here is the Galax Hall of Fame Power Board. So, um, it's basically just a VRM on a PCB. And the reason why things like this exist is sometimes you buy a GPU for, uh, that has, you know, a terrible VRM and you want to run it on LN2. And so you need to do something about that terrible VRM. This is the solution. And in fact, you could also use this for motherboards, memory power, like, you know, if you need something with a high current throughput and low voltage output that converts 12 volts down to that low voltage, power boards are basically your solution to the issue. So this right here is the Galax take on a power board. Uh, Gigabyte has a power board, EVGA has the ePower, Asus has the, uh, ha also has their own power board. Um, I'm not sure there's an MSI one, but basically with these power boards, there's only two of these that are retail. The Gigabyte one is not retail. The Asus one is not retail. You can buy the Galax Hall of Fame power board for I think around $80 on the Galax store. That's not including shipping. Or you can go and buy an EVGA ePower 5, um, which costs about $250. Um, I don't have an ePower 5 here to show you, but we will be taking a look at this thing. Um, because I do have one of these. So, the Galax take on a power board is actually pretty, um, pretty, pretty brute force. Um, it's not super refined, it's not particularly user-friendly. Then again, these power boards never really are, because they aren't really meant... Like, there's not that many people who are going to go and replace the VRM on their motherboard or a GPU to start with, so... Uh, and those people don't really have much of a choice, so, you know, user-friendliness is not on the big long list of things that need to be included for these things. Um, this specifically, the main issue I have with this one right here, is this maxes out at 1.6 volts if you don't do any modifications to it. Um, or, um, if, if you want to surpass, like, either you physically modify it to surpass the 1.6 volts limitation, or... Uh, you can use the I squared C interface because this actually has an I, I squared. Uh, this connector down here, if I remember correctly, this one right there, that hooks up to the I squared C interface of the IR3595 voltage controller that this comes with. And you can basically, it, it, you know, if you figure out what all the registers on that do, you can technically surpass any voltage limitations. And you could also monitor things like current, VRM temperature, like. You, you can get some pretty awesome readouts out of one of these chips. Uh, the only issue is there's zero documentation for the IR3595's I squared C interface. So you'll have, like, you know, you'll be able to hook up to it. You'll probably be able to get its address, but you will not have an easy time figuring out how to set voltage and that kind of thing because it has a lot of uh, registers available. Like, there's current scale, you can read current, temperature, um, various safeties, and other registers are accessible on it so there's a lot of them and then there's like a lot of registers on it that are just completely unused um but they're still present so that you can see them so it's just yeah really not like that that's the user friendliness thing it's like 1.6 volts for a power board is just not enough and the lack of documentation for this thing means that even if you do you know hook up an i square like an arduino or a raspberry pi for the i square c interface um you're gonna have a hard time doing anything because th there's no information on what anything on the controller does. So that's a bit unfortunate. I mean, you can probably like, if you work, now if you have some kind of like company account with International Rectifier, I'm sure they'll give you the full data sheet for that chip. <laughs> but you know, that is like, yeah, that, that only works well if you're uh, working at a you know, ma ma uh, manufacturer that has a relationship with International Rectifier. So that kind of sucks. What doesn't suck, however, is the power capabilities and just the layout of this thing. I personally really like the layout. So uh, when this is running, you get voltage on this end. So this is your V-core output. And then this strip behind that, that's ground. This strip along here, that's ground. That strip along there, that's ground. That is ground, more ground down here, and more ground along this edge. So you have a ton of very easily accessible grounding plane, um, which is really important because we'll... I actually have a torn down 290X because I plan to install this on a 290X, so I'll show you exactly why it is so handy that Galax has basically given you this great big U of ground everywhere. 
Um, but before we take a look at the, uh, the sort of installation stuff, let's talk about the MOSFETs under this heatsink. So, that's held together with just four screws. Here we go. So, the heatsink is very open air, um, not exactly heavy. Uh, it's actually really light, <laughs> considering how much space it takes up. Um, but it does have a lot of surface area, and I think they've intentionally made it so open airflow because basically any air being shoved into this heatsink will get through the slits and then actually hit the PCB. So the PCB's surface area is also used as part of the cooling. Uh, this is the board naked. And these chips right here are international rectifier IR3555s. These are 60 amp power stages. Um, which means this can pack a hell of a punch given enough airflow. That's the other issue. Um, so basically, power capability wise, this can push 480 amps of current, 1.2 volts, 300 kilohertz switching frequency, um, which this being a 16 phase and that being an IR3595, uh, this is a doubled up VRM. So this is a, uh, the 3595 is an eight phase voltage controller. So you actually have four doubler chips, which you can actually see. That's these little squares right here. And those are IR3599s. They're really dumb doublers, but they'll work just fine for an application like this. Um, and really like once you get to eight phases, there's not many options for getting more power throughput. So, especially if you want to use power stages, you just have to stack doublers. So, yeah, th this is as far, like, you don't really get better phase counts than this. Now, um, where was I? 3555's current capabilities, right. So, 1.2 volts, 300 kilohertz switching frequency. Yeah, because I mentioned switching. Yeah, okay. So, 300 kilohertz switching frequency. This VRM right here can do 480 amps of current at 48 watts of heat dissipation. This heatsink will handle that no problem. It can do 720 amps at 96 watts of heat dissipation. That might start being a bit of an issue. Um, but I'm sure a 4000 RPM delta fan or even a 7K RPM delta fan will probably take care of that. Um, now, Galax actually advertises this as being capable of 960 amps, which I get where they get that rating from. These are 60 amp power stages. It's a 16 phase, 60 times 16, 960 amps. And that's all very well and good until you realize that at a uh, 960 amps current output, this will produce about 180 watts of heat. I don't think there's a fan strong enough to make this heat sink dissipate 180 watts of heat. Nonetheless, I don't also know of any GPUs that need a 960 amps of power. In fact, you could probably power a single, like, you could power a single GTX 590, so that's two JF110 cores, which each of those will pull about, say, you know, 300, maybe 400 amps. You could power it off of one of these. Just one, which is ridiculous because, well... It's strong enough for two GPUs and power, like, two dual GPU cards. Um, though it probably would be better if you still had two separately. Now, that was all at 1.2 volts. Um, and I'm not going to actually give you ratings for the maximum voltage, because this sets the core voltage using this dip switch right here, which, as I said before, it is limited to 1.6 volts. Um which is just obnoxious, but if you do modify this for 1.8 volt output or use the I2C interface to get higher voltage outputs, 1.8 volts um, will give you 480 amps through, you know, at uh, 60 watts of heat dissipation, 720 amps at 120 watts of heat dissipation. That might start being an issue again. And then a theoretical 960 amps at 225 watts of heat dissipation. There's no way this is doing that. There just isn't any way. Um, and speaking of the 960 amp rating, at 1.2 volts, that 960 amps, 225, uh, 180 watts heat output, um, you'd have to keep the uh, MOSFETs, the ground pad of these MOSFETs, below 128 degrees centigrade. So basically, um, if you were measuring the temperature of the VRM, say right on the back here, you wouldn't really want to see a temperature 
in excess of, say, 110 degrees, because you do have to account for the fact that you're not actually measuring the uh, temperature of the ground pad of one of these directly, which, um, yeah, that's the main difference between, like, the IR3555 and the 3575. The 3575 has an exposed drain, um, so actually the top of the casing of the MOSFETs, here we can just see black squares, but the 3575, which is slightly better as a power stage than these, um, that has a, like, it's actually the same silicon internally, but it has a upgraded cooling system. So, yeah, um, th this is a bit, like, th this ultimately is going to be about keeping the temperature really low, and I don't think this heatsink can handle uh, 180 watts, no matter how much airflow you throw at it. Well, I mean, no matter how much airflow you throw at it with conventional airflow, provide, you know, uh, conventional airflow uh, acquirement means. Uh, I'm sure somebody would be like, oh yeah, you could stick a jet engine on it. That would give you enough airflow. It's, well, yeah, but that doesn't really count. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of wondering what would happen if somebody made a water block for one of these. Because then you could probably hit that 960 amp current rating on this and that would be pretty freaking crazy. At which point I would have no, like, fears about using this. Like, I'm pretty sure up to, say, 1.4 volts, this could power a GTX 590. Um, past 1.4 volts, I'd start to be worried because you do have two JF110s on that card. Um, but any single GPU, any single core GPU, this is ridiculous overkill. It is absolutely insane. <laughs> this is literally the best. Like, yeah, it could have 3575s to improve the cooling a bit, but ultimately this thing is an absolute beast. So it's just too bad that for some reason Galax was like, we'll lock it up, lock it at 1.6 volts. Because funnily enough, um, that dip switch could theoretically allow you to set higher voltages than 1.6 volts, but, any time, but every time I've tried that, the entire VRM shuts down. So basically there's a safety trip point programmed onto the, into the IR3595 to shut down if you try to get a more than 1.6 volts output, which I'm not really sure why they did that because this should easily, like these power stages definitely support uh, more than 1.6 volts output. The electrolytic capacitors on the front, these are all four volts rated. So unless these, poly these uh, SMD caps, which I'm not sure if these are tantalum or electrolytic, doesn't really, like, not super important right now, but uh, I'm not sure what voltage those are rated for, but unless those are rated for, like, 2 volts, I really think Galax could have given us a higher voltage range on this out of the box. 1.6 is just not enough, because the other issue with these power boards is, is um, when you hook these up, you get a bit of voltage drop. Uh, across your connections and especially if your connections suck like mine do so you end up with a bit of voltage drop so if you want like 1.6 volts at the back of the gpu core so actually going into the silicon of the gpu you need to set like 1.65 on the actual power board because you're not going to get the voltage you want now there are some power boards that offer forward voltage sense so basically you can hook up the feedback circuit from the IR3595, you'd hook that up to like a capacitor on the back of the GPU core so it reads voltage right behind the load, um, which that would help, well basically the 3595 could compensate for the V droop on its own, for the voltage drop across your connection uh, better. But this lacks that as well, that's not a feature on this. Um, so that, that's kind of unfortunate. In terms of other features you have, you have four LEDs up here to indicate that this is working. Um, you have one indicating that you have output voltage, 3.3 volts, drive voltage, and 12 volts. So um, you do need to actually plug in all three 8-pins. It won't power on with one 8-pin only. And for some reason, there's a jumper for enabling and disabling the VRM. Now, luckily, Galax figured that, you know, people like me who buy this thing are likely to lose this jumper. So as long as that jumper is removed, this provides voltage. If you, you know, short the two pins again, then it stops providing voltage. So that's nice. You can lose this and this will still work. <laughs> um, if it worked in reverse, then that'd be kind of obnoxious. Uh, though on the other hand, if it worked in reverse, you wouldn't have much reason to remove this if ever. So yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what the idea was behind making this have an off switch like that, but well, it works. 
I also have voltage read points down across this edge right here. There. So you can measure 3.3 volts because they're like this has only 12 volts power going into it. So there's actually a converter to produce 3.3 volts for the 3595 to run on. Then there's a drive voltage converter that should be outputting seven or like five to seven volts, something in between that. It's probably on seven for max efficiency on the 3555s. Um, so yeah, you can check that voltage as well. Then there's a voltage checkpoint for each of the three eight pins. So it is like, you know, it's a really nice power board. Um, I'll give it that. And it's just too bad that it doesn't go higher than 1.6 volts. Um, but overall, I think that like th this is not far from being perfect. <laughs> this is really not far from being perfect. I can't find many things to complain about. Yeah, they could upgrade the power stages a bit um, and they could give you a higher voltage range. But other than that, it's like, it's it doesn't get better in my opinion i mean the the that's the main difference but compared to like the e power 5 from evga the e power 5 doesn't have any of the like oh it only goes up to 1.6 volts and it has a few like the e power 5 is arguably more user friendly in some ways than this is but this is definitely more powerful um there's just like this puts out as much heat while pushing 720 amps as the e power puts out when pushing 600 amps so this thing is a freaking beast. Um, it's just a little rough around the edges. But then again, if you're somebody capable of wiring one of these up, you should also be capable of modifying it for more than 1.8 volts output. I mean, more than 1.6 volts output. So let's actually talk about power, how you would wire one of these up, because I've had a lot of people ask me um, about, yo, how do you use power boards? Say hello to my 290X. Or uh, there. Um, as you can clearly see, so basically how these attach, and this is not finished. I was just doing some early pre-testing, because um, here's the thing. These power boards, you need to push a lot of current. Because, well, GPUs run on a lot of current. That means you need a lot of very beefy power connections. Um, so, basically, and ultimately, I'm... Your the main problem I've always run into is ground connections, which is why I so appreciate that giant U shape that this comes with uh, of ground, because it just makes finding ground good grounding points e so much easier. But basically, what I've done here with the 290X is you can see that well, this right here is auxiliary. This is an HD787 TVRM that I ripped off, um, and. That is hooked up to the auxiliary rail, so that is supposed to provide 1.1... 1. 1, well, this is stuck at 1.15 volts. Well, no, it's not stuck at that. It doesn't go below 1.15 volts. It goes all the way up to 1.8 or 1.85, something like that. I'm not quite sure where I set the limit, but it, it, it can provide enough voltage to burn down most hardware. Um, but it does not go below 1.15 volts. And actually, I have the same issue on my RX 480 GTR power board, which also doesn't go below 1.15 volts, which I'm kind of annoyed about. And the GTR power board goes all the way over 2.15 uh, volts. So that one's really good at killing stuff because it, it, it has way too much voltage available on it. But so that's the auxiliary rail. But for V-Core, what I'm doing, and actually you do this for any voltage you want to replace, you first pull out your inductors. So that disconnects the original set of MOSFETs from the VRM. And the reason why you do this is you don't want the stock 12 volt power of the card to be actually usable. So you disconnect all of your inductors. How you do that is up to you. I, like, I've never managed to successfully desolder SMD inductors. They're a freaking nightmare. Um, so, and actually I know a lot of other people like just like other people who've done power board mods, it's just like SMD inductors do not come off. You need some very special equipment. Like, think you might need a hot air station and a lot of patience to get them off because they are, you know, they're large components with a lot of thermal mass. I don't have a hot air station right now, so I just basically bashed them off because they're powder. They're like sintered, like they're a powdered metal uh, core. So they're really easy to just crack up and like break and then desolder what's the actual internal wiring. I, I've de tried to desolder that. So you can see I removed the five uh, inductors from this board. 
And the reason why I had to, like, why I'm power boarding a 290X is because I actually broke the VRM here on this card doing some modifications um, on, on this card. So I was just testing some modifications out so that I wouldn't have to test them on a Fury because this uses the same voltage controller as a Fury. And that's how I found out you really don't want to try messing with the current sense of an international rectifier voltage controller. It's just not worth it. Um, way too much effort. And even when it works, it works really badly. But basically remove your inductors and then you start soldering in uh, connection wires. So these are gonna be all V-core. These great big globs, that's gonna be all V-core. So I'm using eight gauge cable. So I'm gonna have five V-core connections here. Uh, and then I'm going to be pulling uh, ground. I'm actually going to be pulling ground from this side of the capacitors, um, of these capacitors, because that's a really, like, this is going to be a strong ground plane. Uh, you wouldn't really want to bother with pulling a ground from all the way over here, because if you think about it, the current, right, even if you put an 8-gauge cable here, the problem is you have current going, if this was theoretically wired up, right, like so, then you have current going from this edge into the PCB right here, to the GPU core, and then going back from the GPU core to that screw hole, then through a wire into this piece, you know, into this copper plane, and it just takes forever. So not worth it. Really not worth it bothering with screw holes all the way on the other end of the GPU. So basically my plan for wiring ground, which is why I like this board so much in terms of layout, is actually you can see that that right there is actually a ground pad. So I had that spot there is hooked up to that wire so that's a ground line and then i have v core just going right here i'm not actually going to probably not going to bother with hooking up more v core lines because in my experience it's well my experience with these is really low but basically it's it gen like what i've noticed is like if you just screw up your ground it's often worse than if you have not enough v core um because this connection is really short so basically the plan for me here is have that hooked up to V core, so there will be five of those tabs. And then I'm going to be hooking ground all the way to this side of these capacitors. I'll be hooking this ground plane to that screw hole, that ground plane to this screw hole. I'll be doing that from both sides because obviously I can flip the card over. And look, we uh, we still have access to these ground planes, so I'm still going to be putting wires there. Potentially maybe try pull ground off of these capacitors, but that's really close to a bunch of the little SMDs for the memory chips. So that's kind of a risky operation there. Might not do that. Um, if I want to hook up any more V-Core, uh, which is actually why I have such a... And I touched the thermal paste. Yay, I'm all messy. Oh, well, if I want to hook up more V-Core, I'm thinking again of just pulling V-Core from the P PCB and right behind the card again, because there's just not that much space to hook up V-Core here. Uh, one thing I've sort of considered doing is trying to desolder the low side MOSFETs and use their ground pads, but... While they're not very hard to desolder, the International Rectifier Direct FETs come off very easy when you're working with a soldering iron that is this big, <laughs> because this is what you need when you're soldering 8-gauge wires into a GPU PCB. Um, I can remove the Direct FETs, it's just a case of I don't really want to, like, th there's a very... There's a pretty good risk that I might short something out if I'm working on them, so I'm not entirely sure if I want to mess with those. Um, but that would be another good place to pull ground from, because obviously, in the stock configuration, this VRM pushes V-Core, right? V-Core goes from there, and then back to the low side MOSFET. So that's going to be a really strong ground plane right there that you could pull from. And then this, you know, th then it's just a case of doing some gymnastics with the soldering iron to figure out how to get the solder connections onto this end or that end, depending on which side you decide to attach the wires on first. So, yeah, um, this is a freaking awesome power board. I love it. I love the layout. It's too bad it doesn't go above 1.6 volts. That's a very unfortunate 290X. And speaking of the very unfortunate 290X, this has a problem. For some reason, I'm not getting memory power, so I'm probably gonna have to attach a third power board because, you know, th this doesn't look bad enough once we do this. It, it's gonna have to have another one hanging on, uh, probably from behind because there's just not enough space on the front of the board at this point. So, which again, that would be an advantage with the, uh, for the ePower 5. The ePower 5 does have a second voltage output, which is why it's a 12 plus two phase. This is a 16. 
the e-power 5 is a 12 plus 2. So you could use that plus 2 part for the memory power because this isn't turning on. I'm not particularly interested in finding out why it isn't turning on. So it's just, e at this point, it's just easier to use another power board, um, which it's kind of unfortunate that this is only single output. Um, but yeah, this is also like way cheaper than an ePower 5. This cost 80 bucks. The ePower 5 is 250. So <laughs> personally, I'm like, I can buy three of these for the price of one ePower 5. And this thing is like, you know, if, if I had three of these, I could power board the entire 290X with 16 phase memory power, which is completely pointless, but I could do it. So I really like this board. And yeah, that's that's a bit about power boards. Um, hopefully I can get that 290X working, because the issue is I actually don't know if this card even works anymore. Um, I just know that last time I tested it with when it still had its inductors, it didn't turn on. Um, and now, well, you know, it's and now it still doesn't turn on right now when, when I attach the Hall of Fame because, well, there's no memory power. But once I get the memory power back, hopefully it turns on and then we can run it on liquid nitrogen until it catches on fire or something. Kind of annoyed that it's just like I have this hanging off and then there's going to be like the GTR hanging off of it as well. That's going to suck. <laughs> That's going to suck so bad. But, uh, well, it's going to be a mess. It's not going to suck. I hope it's not going to suck. I hope it overclocks well. It's just, it's going to be a horrific mess. Also, this 290X just kind of sucks because these are all Alpida memory chips and that they clock like garbage. But, yeah. You know, th this isn't garbage. We're going to put a very nice VRM on a really bad card, and that's kind of the point of these. <laughs> um, because you'll also see, if you're doing, like, legacy benchmarking, uh, actually not legacy benchmarks, but legacy hardware, like, there's a huge, in, in extreme overclocking, you know, it's just huge, it's super popular to basically overclock, like, older generation hardware. Um, and this is super useful, because then you don't have to worry about hunting down, like, a 290X Lightning, or a 580 Lightning, or a 480 Lightning, or a 6970 Lightning, or a Matrix. You don't need to look for a good GPU. You can buy a terrible reference card, buy one of these monstrous power boards, and replace all the VRM, like replace the, the vCore VRM, or, well, usually vCore is the one that blows up on you when you put a card under liquid nitrogen. Um, so, yeah, that's why these things exist. I think they're freaking awesome. It's just too bad I suck at using them. Um, and yeah, I, I can't like I can't wait to get this to fire up, assuming it still works. So we'll see, um, we'll see. Might might be, yeah. Um, anyway, this video is really long again, isn't it? So let's pack it up here because I've run out of things to ramble about. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. So wait. How does this go with YouTube? Right, like, share, subscribe, leave a comment down below, or any questions that you may have. Uh, if you have any complaints, you can leave them down below as well. Uh, and I, a huge thanks to the patrons for actually making this video possible because Galax did not send this for free. I actually went and bought it. So huge thanks to the patrons for funding this. <laughs> not the 290X, I had that for ages. But um, yeah, uh, and if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, there's a PayPal, a Patreon, which I just mentioned, and there's shirts, and you can find all of those in a link down in the description below. There's also a bunch of other links to, like, Facebook, where you can follow smaller updates on what I'm doing. And yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.